So, welcome back. We've had a look at the scope and we've had a look at the applicability of Article 34. Now we need to move on to think about what does Article 34 prohibit? So Article 34 prohibits quantitative restrictions and measures having equivalent effects to quantitative restrictions. So quantitative restrictions are defined in the Ghetto case, very early case from the 1970s, as anything that is a total or partial restraint of import, export or goods in transit. And there are further examples of quantitative restrictions in the textbooks. Measures having equivalent effect to quantitative restrictions are defined in the Dassonville case, which I'm going to discuss further in a minute. As I said, you will want to start to build up a list of types of measures having equivalent effect to quantitative restrictions in your notes. And one place to start, along with the textbooks, which will also give you cases to help your answers, is Directive 7050 EEC. It's no longer in force, but it'll give you an idea. And here are some examples. Labelling rules, campaigns to promote nat national products, price fixing rules, basically non-tariff barriers that have the same effect as quotas, anything where there is a regulatory divergence between the two member states. Now this is the key case and this is the definition of MEQRs in Article 34 TFEU. Article 34 covers all trading rules enacted by member states which are capable of hindering directly or indirectly, actually or potentially, intra-community or now we would say intra-EU trade. So let's start to look at that in a little bit more detail. All trading rules. Now actually the court has extended this um, definition to include also rules, for instance, about the production stage of goods. So, for example, in the Kramer case, the court held that national rules limiting fishing to preserve fish talk are included within the scope of Article 34, even if technically they're not rules pertaining to trade, they're rules pertaining to how the product is produced. All trading rules enacted by member states. Again, the European Court of Justice has adopted a very generous approach here and said that the rules do not need to be legally binding. So in the Commission in Ireland case, a campaign sponsored by the Irish government, but not legally binding, established a practice that could be caught by member states. It could be caught by Article 34, even though it wasn't embodied in binding law. And the trading rules need to be enacted by member states, but we've already seen that Article 34 applies in principle also to official action, so to the views of national officers or sponsorship programmes of private bodies in charge of certifying compliance with technical standards under national law. And there you need to be looking at the Fra Bo case and seeing how that interacts with the rules on certification of compliance with minimum harmonisation rules. The trading rules have to be capable of hindering directly or indirectly. Now this is a reference to whether the measure is distinctly applicable or indistinctly applicable. So distinctly applicable measures treat foreign and domestic products differently. So they are fairly obvious restraint on trade. But indistinctly applicable measures treat foreign and domestic products the same, but nonetheless have an indirect effect on trade. And that is the kind of rule that much of the case law under Article 34 is all about. Furthermore, there has to be not necessarily an actual effect on interstate trade, but a potential effect is enough. So if you have a look at the foie gras case commissioned in France, the French rules on composition of foie gras are caught by Article 34, even if very little foie gras is produced outside of France, because they have a potential effect on trade. And in the Bloomer case, the Court of Justice held that there is no de minimis aspect to Article 34. So a rule can be caught by Article 34 even if it affects only a minimum share of the market of a member state. And Bloomer was about the effect on the market of a small island belonging to Denmark. So what categories of measures are caught by Article 34? They can be distinctly applicable measures or they can be indistinctly applicable measures. 
So distinctly applicable measures are measures that impose additional requirements on imports, like the requirement of inspection of imported goods, or rules giving preference to domestic products like binational rules, or denomination of origin rules. So those are lawful only if they denote distinguishing qualities or characteristics of a product. And that is illustrated in the Vine for Trebers case, where the court held that Article 34 was breached by a German rule that authorised the use of the Sekt or Weinbrandt name only for products origin originating in Germany or in a country where Germany was the official language. The area of origin defined on the basis of national territory or language is not a geographical area justifying denomination of origin. So this is a similar story to the Pistre case that we already looked at. Now, indistinctly applicable rules, as I've just said, had a, have a much, much wider reach. And we already talked about Cassis de Dijon in the previous lecture. And if you don't remember enough about that, please do go back to that lecture and have another look. And we'll come to the other categories on this slide, rules relating to selling arrangements and rules relating to the use of goods in a minute. But before we do that, this is very important. Not all rules within the scope of Article 34 are unlawful. Rules that fall within the scope of Article 34 might still be lawful because they might be justified either under Article 36 TFEU or based on case law. So let's have a quick look at Article 36 TFEU. Article 36 TFEU provides that the provisions in Article 34 and 35 shall not preclude, so it's an exception, prohibitions or restrictions on imports, exports or goods in transit justified on, and there is a list of grounds, grounds of public morality, public policy or public security, the protection of health and life of humans, animals and plants the protection of national treasures, or the protection of industrial or commercial property. So that is a closed list of exceptions, and there's case law on each of those about how the Court of Justice interprets each one. Article 36 goes on to say, such prohibitions or restrictions shall not, however, constitute a means of arbitrary discrimination or a disguised restriction on trade between member states. So again, you'll see from the case law under Article 36 that if the Court of Justice thinks that this is actually a disguised restriction on trade, then the court will find that it is not a justified rule under Article 36. In addition to this closed list of um, possible justifications in Article 36, there is also an open and extendable list that includes consumer protection, environmental protection and so on in the case law of the European Court of Justice. And again, you will be wanting to make sure that you have plenty of examples of that case law so that you can tackle problem questions where a member state is trying to justify a national rule on the basis that that national rule is there for a reasonable reason. The mandatory requirements part of Cassis de Dijon. So Article 34 prohibits non-tariff barriers. When we think about transnational trade, tariff barriers are important, but they're nowhere near as important as non-tariff barriers. And some examples of MEQRs include Import licenses, even if those are granted automatically, that's the International Fruit Company case, or inspections and controls, such as in the Rover, Rover Central Finance case, or an obligation to produce a certificate, such as in the Denkovit case, a prohibition on sale of goods of a certain description, as we saw in the Cassis de Dijon case, or also the Gilly case, requirements as to the presentation or the labelling of products, such as in the Rao and de Schmidt case, or the Schwarz case involving unwrapped chewing gum from vending machines, or the Feature case, or the Mars case, incitement to purchase domestic products in preference to imports, like the Buy Irish case, restrictions on possession, like the Bransma case, or storage, like the Eggers case, or restrictions on healthcare coverage, like the Decca case and the Care Optica case. And you'll find many other examples of cases in the textbooks. In some senses, it doesn't matter exactly which ones you 
um, find or put in your notes. What matters is that you have enough of them so that you can tackle problem questions with plenty of good examples. Now, what about measures that do not discriminate directly or indirectly against imports at all? So this was an issue that rose in a case called Torfail and B&Q, where a Welsh court referred to the Court of Justice of the European Union on whether a national rule that banned trading on a Sunday was an MEQR in the sense of Article 34 TFEU. Now, this Sunday trading rule was not aimed at imports in any sense. But the Court of Justice of the European Union held that that rule fell within the scope of Article 34. It was a measure having equivalent effect to quantitative restrictions. The court went on to hold that that rule could be justified. But it was a controversial ruling because B&Q, a large um, hardware store, was using EU law to tackle what was essentially a domestic cultural issue. Should Sundays be a day of rest? B&Q was able, because of its size and its market share, to open on a Sunday. Smaller local firms would not be able to do that. They might then be squeezed out of the market altogether. This was not just a trade issue. It was a matter of cultural and social practices and whether they could be challenged by individual powerful firms relying on EU internal market law. In the Keck case, the court reversed this line of case law. Contrary to what has been previously decided, the court said, rules relating to selling arrangements that have no discriminatory effects in law or in fact fall outside the scope of Article 34 TFEU. The rationale behind the Keck case is that if there is no discrimination, no discrimination in law or fact, rules relating to selling arrangements like Sunday trading rules or the prohibition at issue in Keck on resale at a loss, loss leaders, are less restrictive of free trade than product related measures. Why is that the case? Because they do not require traders in one member state to produce products according to a particular specification to be sold in another member state. The Keck test was elaborated and applied in a series of further cases involving rules relating to selling arrangements. For example, rules limiting the time at which goods can be sold, like the Bermans or the Punta Caso or the Sermonaro case, or the um, Pelkmanzi case on Sunday trading rules overturning the Tofen case, or rules relating to the requirement to have premises in the locality, like the Heimdienst rule or Doc Morris or Commission in Germany on hospital pharmacies, or restrictions on the number or type of sales outlets, like the infant milk case and particular A-Punkt on door-to-door -door sales, or restrictions on pricing, like the ITM case or the Libro case. So there's a summary of the Keck rule as it now stands in the Karner case. Provisions concerning the place and times of sale, among other things, of certain products and the advertising of those products, as well as certain marketing methods, are provisions governing selling arrangements within the meaning of Keck, and provided that they have the same effect on domestic Italy produced and imported goods in law and in fact, then they fall outside the scope of Article 34. If they have a differential scope on imported goods in fact, then even if they are rules relating to selling arrangements, they still fall within the scope of Article 34. And that is the Para 16 proviso of the Keck case. Now, what about, finally, rules about the use of products? So this is illustrated by a couple of cases. I'll just to tell you a little bit about the motorcycle trailers one. So Italy prohibited the use of motorcycles towing, towing trailers within its territory. Considering this rule to be an obstacle to the free movement of goods, contrary to Article 34, the Commission brought proceedings against Italy before the Court of Justice for a failure to fulfil its obligations. And in this judgment, the Court clarifies its case law on the definition of measures of having equivalent effect to quantitative restrictions within the meaning of Article 34 TFEU. 
Firstly, the court affirmed that measures having equivalent effect refer not only to the discriminatory national rules and the rules that lay down requirements to be met by goods, even if they're applicable to all products alike, but also, as the court put it, to any other measure which hinders access of product, products origin, uh, originating in other member states to the market of a member state. So a market access test. The court specifies that this latter category includes measures relating to selling arrangements or to the use of the product insofar as access to the national market is hindered. In the case at issue, according to the court, the prohibition on the use, as intended, of trailers specially designed for motorcycles in Italy prevents a demand from existing in the Italian market for this type of product. Consequently, the legislation in question has the effect of hindering the access of these trailers to the Italian market and is likely to be covered by the prohibition in Article 34 TFEU. The court went on to say that the rule could be justified, but only if it was a proportionate restriction. And there's similar reasoning in the Mickelson case concerning jet skis being banned from use in inland waterways. Sweden had a rule laying down that jet skis could only be used on general nav navigable waterways and other waterways that are expressly permitted by local rules. As a matter of fact, no such local rules had been passed and consequently jet skis could only be used on general navigable waterways. But general navigable waterways are relatively few and they're very busy with commercial traffic. So in practice, therefore, the actual use of jet skis in Sweden was merely marginal. And even if the national regulations at issue do not have the aim or the effect of treating goods coming from another member state less favourably, the restriction which they impose on the use of the product in the territory of the member state may, depending on its scope, said the court, have a considerable influence on the behaviour of consumers, which may in turn affect the access of that product to the market of that member state. Consumers, knowing that the use permitted by such regulations is very limited, have only a limited interest in buying that product. Now, again, in Mickelson and Rose, justification was available in theory. So we can bring all of this together and think about how, in practice, you might approach a problem question that involves an element on free movement of goods. You need to think about the different categories of measures. Is it a quantitative restriction? Is it a rule relating to a selling arrangement or a use rule? Or, or is it a measure having equivalent effect to quantitative restrictions. Quantitative restrictions breach Article 34 unless they're justified um, under Article 36 or justified by the court's case law if they are indistinctly applicable quantitative restrictions, which is pretty difficult to imagine. Rules relating, to, well, no, it's not difficult to imagine within the broad definition of quantitative restrictions. Rules relating to selling arrangements fall within the scope of Article 34 if there is a different burden on them in law or in fact, depending on whether the goods are produced domestically or imported. But if it's the same burden in law and fact, and the, the rule relates to selling arrangements, then they fall outside the scope of Article 34. Measures having equivalent effect to quantitative restrictions can be distinctly applicable, and that they breach Article 34 unless they're justified. They can be product requirements, like in Cassis de Dijon, which breach Article 34 unless justified under either Article 36 or the broader list of mandatory requirements in Cassis de Dijon. Any other measures which hinder market access, like use rules, also breach Article 34 unless justified. Now, there's a tabular form in the form of a flowchart which shows you how to work your way through this on page 374 of the Barnard and Peers EU Law Book, published by OUP in 2020 and available for you on Law Trove. It is very, very important to remember this point. The rules that we've talked about that fall within the scope of Article 34 are suspect rules, but they're not necessarily always unlawful because they can be justified either under Article 36 or based on case law that can save the rule. And that case law has themes that go across all the different four freedoms. In particular, the way that the Court of Justice applies the justifications is the same across 
all four freedoms. So we'll come back to that point when you've studied some of the other free freedom of movement rules. And again, now seems to be a good moment for a quick pause. I'm just going to grab a cup of coffee and I'll see you in a minute.